Hello, welcome to the presentation on genre, or once upon a time there was a beautiful and talented genre. <laughs> okay, David Bartholomew, an American professor of composition studies, opens up his now classic essay called Inventing the University with these words about what's involved in being a college student. Here he goes. Every time a student sits down to write for us, he has to invent the university. The student has to learn to speak our language, to speak as we do, to try on the peculiar ways of knowing, selecting, evaluating, reporting, concluding and arguing that define the discourse of our community. Or perhaps I should say the various discourses of our community. A student after the first year or two must learn to try on a variety of voices and interpretive schemes. To write, for example, as a literary critic one day and as an experimental psychologist the next. To work within fields where the rules governing the presentation of examples or the development of an argument are both distinct and even to professional mysterious. Alright, I'll stop there. Um, you might say, well, okay, yeah, that's at the college level. But, of course, long before that, school is often the place where these academic discourses are learned, are first learned, or not learned. A useful way to think about what has to be learned is to think of certain privileged genres. The genres of the academy, we might say. But what is a genre? And how does linguistics study them? Well, in this presentation, we will explore genre from the same sociolinguistic perspective that we explored register in a previous presentation. And let me put it like this. Where register describes language variation according to how it is affected by social contexts, right? genre describes the predictable or expected functional elements of those social contexts. According to J.R. Martin, a linguist whose work is, his work in education is pretty well known in Australia, he was also a student of M.A.K. Halliday, defines it, defines genre like this. A genre is a staged, goal-orientated, purposeful activity in which speakers engage as members of our culture. So the challenge of acquiring the academic language or discourse that Bartholomew spoke of is the challenge of engaging in a practice as a member, ideally as a fully fledged member of that practice, or at least as someone who can approximate how things get done with the language. Because we sometimes find ourselves really on the periphery of a human practice, where we're, we're, we're um, um, novices of the practices very often, especially if it's an academic practice, like the practice of linguistics. But let's not lose this basic point. Genres are how things get done when language is used to accomplish them. Defining genres this way, we can see that this concept of genre needs to be taken in a very wide sense. There are as many different genres, well almost, as there are activity types. And there are a lot of, so um, let's, let's, let's just pause and think about that for a minute. That there are lots of genres and lots of types of genres. And in fact, here are a few of them. Literary genres, popular written genres, educational genres, everyday genres. I'm sure you can think up more. When we think of genres, we most commonly think perhaps of that first type on that list there, the literary genres. We think of the sonnet or the detective novel. But see if you can come up with some examples of, uh, for each of these four categories.
And so here's what I came up with. Considering the last category, um, you might not think of everyday genres as genres, but imagine the common activity of going to buy a loaf of bread. Imagine doing that, say, in a Moroccan market. Um, okay, you've got you've got a maybe another language to deal with, but um, it's not just a it's not just a, a foreign language that you're dealing with there too. It's just the way the whole activity is carried out. Generally, when we go and buy a loaf of bread uh, in the U.S., we don't have to barter for it. So, um, learning to buy bread in, the, in a Moroccan marketplace is learning a particular genre. Um, the basic principle then is: is if we can recognise a social activity like buying bread, there's a genre involved, a somewhat predictable functional form that the language is is that the language has. Okay, so um, genre describes the context of culture. As such, then, it's more abstract than the context of situation, which is what register um, describes. In other words, genre incorporates register. So the realization of genres is mediated through the realization of registers. Register involves language analysis that looks at specific situations, or types of situations. Genre involves language analysis that looks at situations at a cultural level, a more abstract level of analysis, if you will. Well, let's look at one of these, these cultural levels, these cultural forms, I should say. Um, the one I've chosen is the academic essay. Um, a cultural pattern we often find um, in this um, uh, genre seems to be something like the following. Statement of thesis, presentation of evidence, dismissal of counter evidence, Summary of evidence, reiteration of thesis. Now I'm giving you this cold, so let me explain a few things about this, this strange looking text that I've put on the screen here. Notice that the whole thing appears between square brackets. This is a convention that some sociolinguists use to signal that everything appearing between these is a description of the functional stages of a genre. Um, it's saying that this particular genre tends to have this particular structure. So let's look at it a bit more closely. Notice the um, the upturned V symbol or carrot. Uh, th that merely separates the functional stages of the genre. The um, the curly brackets. Can you see where they are. Um, this signals recursivity for anything inside the brackets. Recursivity, what's that? Well, basically, this means that the presentation of evidence, dismissal of counter evidence, is something likely to be found repeating itself. So often, essays end with a, with a and, then, and then, okay, so it sort of repeats itself. And then, finally, essays end with a reiteration of the thesis. Okay, now, uh, this analysis here isn't saying that this must be the structure of any academic essay genre in order to count as one, in order to count as an academic essay. It's not saying that. It's not meant to be taken prescriptively, in other words. And neither is it meant to be taken as an exhaustive analysis. There's a lot more going on in an academic um, piece of writing that is captured by this, as we saw in the previous two presentations. But it is saying that academic essays are a potential genre, and this is a common form in which they might get realised, what you see on the screen. And probably this is true for a number of academic fields, such as psychology, linguistics, history and so forth. Uh, all those fields have academic essays, and very likely they will have a form similar to this.
The following configuration of register variables gives us genres that are acceptable in US culture. For example, the everyday genre of buying a car. Or you could imagine the genre for learning shorthand, an instructional genre. Shorthand is not something we maybe need to do anymore. But the, po the point is here is that genres have cultural limits what's deemed acceptable in a given culture. For example, we don't normally, or we don't feel comfortable comfortable recognizing this genre. Uh, a transactional tenor operating in the field of babies. See, I'm, I'm talking like a social linguist here. A transactional tenor, salesperson to customer, um, operating in the field of babies. Um, and we don't recognize the instructional tenor operating with teaching shorthand if the mode is the telephone. So we're doing a little bit of revision here of register. So in other words, and for different reasons then, these two are not potential genres. So not anything can count as a genre. Well, let's go back to um, the structure of genres. Why do texts have a schematic structure? Well, the answer is, um, is that a genre accomplishes something. Hence, Martin writes, schematic structure represents the positive contribution genre makes to a text a way of getting from A to B in the way a given culture accomplishes whatever the genre in question is functioning to do in that culture. And the reason that genres have stages is simply that we usually cannot make all the meanings we want to at once. So the stages that we're talking about here, like um, statement of thesis, Going back to the last example, statement of thesis, presentation of evidence, dismissal of evi counter evidence, summary of evidence, reiteration of thesis. Um, that's meant to be taken as functional, not formal. Those elements are functional, not formal. Let me just kind of spell that out a little bit, a little bit more. Um, formally, we can divide the text into stages or parts according to the form of the different parts. Um, so, for example, there's a book. It has different parts, chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, and on each of those, of those parts it has a page. And there they are, and of course we could, we could go on um, dividing it up. But um, functionally, dividing the text into stages, parts, we would have a different a different kind of notion of what the elements would be. So these elements you can see are defined by their functionality rather than their form. All right. I've got a bit of a challenge for you. Um, without giving it too much thought, um, compose a recipe for inclusion in a recipe book. And when you've done that, construct what you consider might be a schematic structure for the genre recipes. All right? <laughs> and also try and articulate any other kinds of linguistic features that you think a characteristic of this genre. All right, so I'm asking you to do two things here. Then, um, after you've after you've had a go at making a recipe, coming up with a recipe, construct what you consider might be a schematic structure for that recipe. Right, uh, using the conventions that we talked about earlier, um, and then see if you can also articulate any other kinds of linguistic features that you think are characteristic of this genre.
So here's what I came up with. It was my great grandmother's recipe handed down. Okay, all right. Sorry, all right, all right. I cheated. Actually, I got it from the internet. I'll, I'll, I'll be, I'll be, uh, I'll be honest. But let's have a look at it schematically. So I'm going to describe the stages of this genre and say a little bit more about their linguistic qualities. And we'll start with this. It has a function. After all, it's a title. Um, the title is um, realized by a nominal group, not by a complete clause or sentence. Spinach risotto. Um, the next bit, uh, in my example, um, I'm going to call enticement. And not all recipes have that, of course. Um, but let's, let's say a bit more about its um, linguistic features. Um, it seems to be realized by complete sentences. Um, beginnings are with a B clause, this dish. Described using positive attitudinal words. Words like traditional, economical, substantial. All right, let's look at another one. Ingredients, nominal groups again. Um, but this time, not classifying words, but numbers and measuring words. And notice that the head noun is the name of a food. And now we have method. Seems to be realized in clauses in the imperative mood. Do this rather than the declarative mood, which would basically be a set of statements. Um, just a quick review of moods. Remember this. Um, there are three. Declarative, imperative, interrogative. Declarative is it like a statement. Imperative would be like a command. And interrogative would be a question. All right. Back to the recipe. Also in method, notice the circumstantial meanings of location in a large saucepan. Time for about 10 minutes and manner till soft. So you've got three things there, location, time and manner. The clauses are linked logically by time sequence. Then, then, right? Then you do this, then you do that. Although this is not always explicitly encoded, uh, then actually only occurs once in this example. Also notice the kinds of verbs are action orientated. Slice, wash, heat, fry, cook, etc. All right. And then finally, serving quantity. Um, this is realized by an elliptical declarative. I love saying that, an elliptical declarative. What's that mean? Well, ellipsis or elliptical here basically means that it's expressed with extreme economy. We only have part of a clause, in other words. The full clause would be this dish serves for something like that. Um, but we don't. We just have this ellipsis serves for. Um, the clause is declarative. It's a statement, not imperative. And I think that's all I can say. Um, so, purely in terms of a schematic functional stage structure, I wonder what you came up with. I came up with this. Notice that enticement is written between regular brackets. This just means it's an optional schematic stage in the genre. Sometimes an enticement is included and sometimes it isn't, as I mentioned earlier. So in terms of all these conventions, we've got square brackets to demarcate the schematic, curly brackets to signal recursivity, and now regular brackets to signal optionality. Are there other ways in which recipes are structured? Of course, but there, but there aren't an infinite number of ways. This is a generic way. Does it have a history? Probably. I'm sure it does. 
it would be very interesting to look at old recipe books to see just how old this structure is. But let's just pause for a minute. Can you see why we have genres? Is it possible to conceive of a meaningful life without genres? Can we combine or synthesize genres? What do you think? Well, I bet you know what play this is. It is, of course, the play written by this man. Interestingly, Romeo and Juliet is a great example, I think, of generic synthesis. This is one of the questions I asked you a moment ago. That is, making a text by putting together something from one or more genres. Romeo and Juliet opens up with a chorus and is written in a very flowery language. Now, such an opening structure and the kind of language that's used would probably have been recognised by the Elizabethan audience as reminiscent of a classic genre of theatre known as comedy. Classic comedy, that is, not, not what we think of as comedy. But then as the play proceeds, at a certain point, the language changes and the whole thing turns into a very different form of theatre. And the text starts to have qualities reminiscent of classical tragedy. So Shakespeare here has created a hybrid of genres, a play that starts off with all the promise of classic comedy, and promise is a feature of comedy, and ends up with all the foreboding of classic tragedy. Nice one, Will. But now, as they say, Monty Python, for something completely different. Yes, I'm going to improvise a story. All this talk about genres, we should spend some time on a narrative genre like storytelling. And why improvise? Well, I'm not really going to improvise, but I am going to show what might be going on when we do improvise such things. I want to do this to bring to our attention just what the dangers might be as well as the possibilities for generic schematic analysis. And hopefully what I've just said there will become clear in a minute. All right, but I must tell you, I've, I've always loved entertaining by telling stories. When I was a boy, uh, admittedly hundreds of years ago now, I used to babysit my young cousins quite frequently and I really look forward to telling them a story at bedtime. At least it was very enjoyable until one day I made the mistake of making a story up on the spot and they really loved it. It had them in it, so I suppose why wouldn't they love it? The only trouble, however, was that they always insisted on me doing a made-up story from that point onwards. Every time I came to read them a bedtime story, they asked me to make one up. We want a story from your head, Jed, they would say. Were they sadists? I don't think so. <laughs> and really, I'm very grateful for this experience because it demonstrated to me that I can be a storyteller any time I want to be, really, more or less. All I need is, a, is an audience. But it also made me think about the meaning of improvisation. Um, why was I able to do it? And um, it's this question that I hope to partly answer in this demonstration in a moment. So, let me pretend to improvise a story, and as I do so, I'm going to indicate what might be going on through my mind as I'm doing it. And um, this is going to show up as red text on the screen. The black text is what actually comes out of my mouth as I'm telling the story, and the red text is a kind of a semi-subconscious voice that's prompting me on. All right, here we go. There was a dog named Sam. And he was walking across the road one day. Walking across a very busy road. Sam should not have been there. 
Sam knew this was not the place to be for a dog. It had been a very bad day for Sam. He was lost. Okay, <laughs> I'll stop there. So it's not finished. I didn't say I was going to finish the story. <laughs> But I think it's enough just to show what I'm trying what I'm trying to do here. I hope you agree that it does sound like a story. It feels like a story, right? Well, let's analyze it a little bit. Um, it's tempting to think that when we improvise something, we're simply um, uh, making something up on the spot and it's all coming from our heads. What geniuses we must be. Well, it's probably not quite as simple as that, and it's really a lot more interesting than that. Um, it's not just coming from my head's cold. So let, let me explain um, or show what I, what I mean. I started off the story like this. There was a dog named Sam, and then a, a kind of voice, as it were, said, and I'll make him cross the road. Um, and where did that come from? Well, it's it's like I'm drawing on my sense that there needs to be agents who do things. If I'm going to tell a story, there needs to be agents who do things. And so I go on. And he was walking across the road one day, and a voice, as it were, says, well, I'll make it a really big road. Um, well, where did that come from? Well, it's as though here I'm uh, drawing on my sense that there needs to be an orientation for the story walking across a very busy road. So I'm getting into this for I sense that this could be dangerous. And where did this sense come from? Well, um, I'm drawing on my sense that there needs to be a complicating action. Sam should not have been there. Oops, sorry. Sam should not have been there. Sam knew this was not the place to be for a dog. And my inner voice says, well, why was he there then? And here it's just like I'm, I'm drawing on my sense that the narrator can produce evaluative comments, which prompts me to say further, yeah, it had been a very bad day for Sam. He was lost. So it's like I'm stepping outside of the sequence of events and I'm uh, evaluating them, commenting on them. And now my mind uh, is going mad with anxiety. What will happen to Sam? What shall I have happen to him after he's crossed the road? Um, it's like here, I'm drawing on my sense that there needs to be a future climaxing action. And the story's movement is the promise of this. So when I stop the story abruptly, I haven't completed it because I'm promising um, some climax that will resolve the, the issue for poor old Sam. So let me just put all these um, points together. Um, and as you see, I've, I've, in, I've titled this um, slide um, Story Grammar. Um, there are four resources then that I was drawing upon that gave me the, the impetus to go in the direction I went when I was improvising. And here they are. I had a sense that there needed to be agents or characters who do things a complicating action, a narrator who can produce evaluative comments, and climaxes, or the promise of climax. Okay, so my admittedly fake improvisation of a folktale seemed to have all of these features. And those aren't just any old features. Those are the kinds of features that lend it um, the form that made it feel like a story was actually unfolding. All right. Mo most um, uh, folk stories have a form like this. Um, well, this person has a little too much to drink and he attacked me. And the friend came in and she stopped it. But so here's the thing I want us to consider. Just like this story here, when I improvise a story for real, 
I'm not necessarily conscious of a theory of storytelling that gives me direction on what to do. Right? I prefer to say I have a feel for the genre. And that feel may amount to so called knowing the story grammar. Okay. And now that the story grammar has been pointed out, and let's face it, this is probably a simplification, we might say, oh, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. But we don't need to be able to articulate the grammar in order to be productive. Well, much of our language competency, to use Chomsky's phrase, is really like that. These deeper structures are kind of internalized and subliminal for the most part. So here's a question. Does it help to do this kind of theoretical work with language? I mean, when I made up stories for my cousins, I didn't know any theories about storytelling. So how does all this tie in with, um, with how we understand language acquisition? Um, what does it m make you think about Krashen's um, uh, idea of, of, of there being two ways of developing a second language, uh, his distinction of acquisition versus learning. All right, some things to think about. Let's, um, let's put this work on storytelling in terms of schematic stages. Orientation, complication, evaluative comments, resolution, evaluative comments, reorientation or coda. So recall that the curly brackets signal recursivity and regular brackets mean the functional element is optional. Um, saying that um, the complication resolution part is recursive is saying that a story could be designed in a way where there is more than one cycle of climaxes. In the readings that go with this presentation, there's a, a nice example of that. All right, um, have a look at this. And come back when you've read it. People tell stories. Stories are about what has happened. In casual conversation, we mostly talk about ourselves what we did, how we feel, what we think. Life is rushing by, only our memories and the stories we tell keeps life from disappearing almost as it happens. So narratives, you could say, are really fundamental. Fortunately for us as teachers, there's a connection between narratives, stories, and the other genres we want to introduce students to. So read this and ask yourself how this young child's text is similar from the text on the previous slide. Both texts are about something the writer has personally experienced, right? The stories are built up around a sequence of actions, getting into dog breeding and going on a school excursion. And so we could list the events like this. And here would be the, um, the excursion list. So um, if I had to answer then what, what are the differences between these two texts, and I had to say it in one word, I'd say it was feelings. In the first text we have, I just fell in love with it. I'd always just liked dogs. She was terrible. She's the worst dog I've ever seen, right? Um, but the child doesn't tell how she felt about the trip. Isn't that interesting? In general, we could, you know, I think this has come out in previous presentations. Speech is personal and writing is impersonal in general. It's a generalization. We write about what has happened and what we think, but not usually about how we feel. Not usually. So I, I don't think we should be critical of the child's text. Uh, it's, it's like um, this child has a, appears to have re recognized, perhaps at a very early stage, that, write, that the writing mode tends to be impersonal. And that's 
you know, quite an important lesson for children to learn, I think. And should we be bothered by it? You know, probably many of us might be. Um, we might think it's kind of cold and alienating. And so uh, we promote expressive writing in our classrooms. And we know children write a lot of stories and, and stories have more scope for using language expressively and it's highly valued. But let's, let's take a look at other kinds. Uh, writing that is about how things are. Right? Writing that is about how things are. Factual writing, in other words. Have a look at these two pieces taken from uh, J.R. Martin's book, Factual Writing. I'm sorry, here they are. The first one is an example of procedural writing. Um, procedure is the closest type of writing, uh, factual writing, to narrative. So, uh, like narrative, it, it's built up around a sequence of events. And the second one is an example of a recount. Recount. Uh, well, what is this? Well, let me just say that text two is text one rewritten as a recount. So, what's the difference? between the two texts. If I could say it in one word, maybe I would say it is generality. Generality. The procedural text talks about how to grow beans, right? And talks generally about how to do this. The people, the places and things are all general. You refers to people in general, not to the reader. Similarly, beans refers to beans as a class. The actions are also general. So the verbs are timeless, referring not to what someone did or is doing or will do, but, but to what they do in general. Get the idea? Um, the young writer achieves this in this particular case um, in, in, in a couple of ways. Um, Sometimes she uses the simple present tense, the first thing you do, by them, and so on. And she also uses imperative clauses, which are not, not marked for tense at all. By them, bring them home, and so on. Um, procedural writing usually um, uh, uh, comes down on 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 one of those two possibilities. You know, in, in a mature text, you'd you'd have one or the other. So you know, but you can tell that this is an, an immature text, but still a pretty good example of procedural writing. Okay, so what about the recounts? Um, recounts are not about generality; they're about specificity, right? Um, the we here refers to particular people. A packet of beans refers to a specific collection of bean seeds. Um, the events then are, are all specific. They actually happened. So let's look at types of procedural genres. Uh, the first text in the previous slide, Procedure, was really a mixture of instructions and directions. And it needed really to be one or the other. So let's have a look at this. Have a look at this again. Um, so what distinguishes instructions from directions, would you say? Well, instructions consist of a series of imperative clauses similar to the one to to um, a feature of recipes remember when we did the recipe it, it came out as a set of imperative clauses for the method part um, so if we're writing instructions we might write something like this in order to grow beans go to the shop get a packet of bean seeds and buy them then bring them home and so on but directions, on the other hand, um, use declarative clauses in the simple present tense with a generalised actor realised by you. 
and less frequently we or one. Um, so if we're writing directions, we might write something like this. In order to grow beans, you go to the shop. You get a packet of bean seeds and you buy them. Then you bring them home. That makes sense? So let's recap. Um, there, are, uh, there are narratives, there are procedures, and there are recounts. Procedural writing can come in the form of instructions or directions, as this slide shows. And that's, well, that's as far as we've gotten so far. OK, so um, students, I think, should get a feel for the differences between recounts and procedures. And what are they? Procedures are general about how things are done. Right? They describe the way the world is focusing on events. Recounts are examples of how particular things get done. They do not generalize beyond particular experiences. So in, in this then, recounts are limited, um, like narrative writing in a way. Um, and that's perhaps why we've developed factual genres, to go beyond individual experience in order to interpret and understand, to produce, in other words, generalizable uh, accounts, generalizable information. Well, importantly, from a teaching perspective, I think it would be good to be clear about all this. And the students should be clear that procedural writing explores the world differently to writing that we might call recounts. All right, now for something completely different. Read this description. What's the purpose of this text, would you say? I'd say it wasn't to tell what happens, but to describe. Texts which focus on particular individuals and specify some of their characteristics um, are descriptions. So this is a descriptive text. Have a look at this one. Birds live up in a tree. If they don't eat, they die. Red birds, black birds, any coloured birds, dark birds, light birds. Some are small and others are big. This is closely related. This is a closely related genre to, to descriptions, isn't it? But focuses on classes of things rather than individuals. Does that remind you of another genre? The report. All right, let's look at this one. Can you see? Well, read it first, and then and then see if you can figure out what I've what I've done here. Basically, what I've done is I've turned the second text, which was a report, into a description. Now we could do the opposite. We could turn the first text, the where my family came from text into a report. So notice that this is thing focused, not event focused. Okay, let's let's try to summarize all these distinctions. So I think this matrix speaks for itself, but you may need to study it a bit before we move on. So you can see the two dimensions that we've been playing with here. Uh, generality versus particularity, that's one dimension. Event focus versus thing focus, that's the other dimension. And those four... Um, those two dimensions, which give us four categories, produce the four um, types of, of writing genres that we've illustrated in the last few slides. Um, and here's a, another summary of all that. So a recount 
how something actually happened, procedure, how something is done, description, what some particular thing is like, a report, what an entire class of things is like. So let's put this into action by applying it to a few samples. Read these two and see if you can see what genre they best embody. The first text, the writer personifies himself as the wind and develops a sort of an imaginative report, right? Through this technique, that's what I would call it. Um, report means it's thing focused, remember, and general. It's about general qualities of the phenomena we call the wind. The second one is um, really a kind of a send-up, a parody, if you like, of the procedure genre. Um, it's event-focused and general. It's about how something is done. Um, and f finally, perhaps to say the obvious, I think both of these pieces are very creative, even though they are, you know, factual. All right, here's another one. This text seems to focus on classes of things and makes a number of general statements about them. Therefore, I would call it a report. It's thing focus and general. However, there's one statement that's not general, uh, but very specific. It says, one skeleton has been found which is 30 meters long. Um, now, taken out of context, this is the kind of statement we would expect in a specific recount event focused particular right or description thing focused particular so what's it doing here you might say well you know specific statements do have a place in report writing in that they're used to illustrate or exemplify a general point that's being made the statement that a 30 meter long skeleton has been found illustrates the preceding general statement that brachiosaurus was the largest dinosaur of all so in a sense, it's a piece of evidence supporting the writer's more general claim. So it still counts as a report. Uh, the use of specific statements to back up general ones is actually an important feature in the development of, of report writing. Let's keep going. Um, here is a sample of a report to study. Report writing often involves students drawing on information from books and the internet. Um, but there's nothing about the genre that makes it that way. Information can be drawn from one's own experience, really, and this is a great example of that. So this text, like the Brachiosaurus text, also makes use of specific statements. For example, it says, our tape recorder is a PYE... SRE 4032 um, and these statements don't appear to be functioning as illustrations of any of the generalizations made earlier in the report so you know it begs the question is the is this writer moving from report to description thing focused particular and it might be good to kind of draw the students attention to that um, earlier in this in the text the writer very effectively I think moves from the general to the specific twice. Number one, uh, buttons, then describes their particular use. And number two, switches, and then describes their particular functions. So that's good. Um, unlike the reports considered earlier, this one is more than a collection of random facts. Um, the information, if you noticed, is organized into sets. 
And this notion of organizing information is going to be looked at in another way when we examine cohesion and syntax in the next presentation. Um, you know, you, you could put headings, um, subheadings, in this text to, to highlight its internal organization. So uh, that makes that makes for a pretty strong strong text. Well, I feel it's that time again, you know, that time as the moon rises and the sun sets. Sam finally got home safely and they all lived happily ever after. As for the risotto, serves four. All right. Well, <laughs> I hope you've enjoyed this, this in introduction to uh, genre and perhaps it's provoked some ideas for how we might involve students, in, involve them into in, also into inquiring about this whole dimension of language variation, because um, I think it's an intriguing way to look at language in an important way. I mean, you may have noticed that several times I translated one genre into another, um, and that that was that's not just a way of better bringing out the differences for the purpose of explanation. It's I think it's also a very interesting and fun thing to do. I want to say it's a playful thing to do, and perhaps we should be promoting a playful and inquisitive attitude with our with our students. Um, so. You know, once you have a feel for the functional stages of a genre, you you can, uh, you know, you can imagine what you can do with that. You can create parodies of it, as we saw some some we saw a parody just a, a few slides back. Um, and I think parodies are are things that kids really appreciate doing. Um, all right. Well, as as always, there will be support materials to a, uh, accompany this presentation. And as always. I hope you've enjoyed it all and uh, see you next time. Take care.